Hello, DeMatha Nation, and welcome to our 75th anniversary DeMatha Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Ben Flary, class of 2011, and current staff member here at DeMatha. I'm joined today by current staff member Connor Glowacki, uh, who will be assisting me in conducting today's interview with famed sports journalist and current editor-in-chief of The Athletic, David Aldridge, DeMatha class of 1983. Uh, David grew up in Northeast D.C. and has spent over 30 years of his life dedicated to covering sports, uh, especially the NBA. Uh, after graduating from American University in 1987, 1987 with degrees in print journalism and history, uh, David worked as a writer for the Washington Post, where he spent nine years as a beat writer covering Georgetown University basketball, the Washington Bullets, and then the Washington Redskins, now the Washington football team. He's also covered big events, including the World Series, the Super Bowl, Stanley Cup playoffs, and the 1992 Summer Olympics in Barcelona. Uh, before joining TNT in 2004, David worked at ESPN for eight years, where he primarily covered the NBA, while also occasionally doing NFL pieces. Uh, throughout his career, he's written for ESPN.com, contributed to ESPN Radio, NBA TV, uh, Washington Post, and the Philadelphia Inquirer, to name a few. Uh, he's made frequent appearances on SportsCenter, as well as NBA Tonight, NBA Today, and as the insider for TNT's Inside the NBA. In 2016, uh, David was awarded the Kurt Gowdy Media Award uh, by the Basketball Hall of Fame, which is given to outstanding basketball writers and broadcasters. He's also received the Legacy Award for the National Association of Black Journalists, uh, awarded annually to Black print, broadcast, digital, or photojournalists of extraordinary accomplishment who has broken barriers and blazed trails. Uh, David was also the recipient of DeMathis Distinguished Alumni Award uh, in 2001. Uh, so before we get to David, I would like to just uh, throw it over to Father James for one second. Father. Thank you, Ben, and hello, DeMatha Nation. Uh, what a, an impressive uh, curriculum vitae for uh, for our speaker, David Aldridge. But you need to add the fact that I was David's guidance counselor when he was a student here. So <laughs> a little bit of credit for that. But why I'm interrupting, uh, David has been one of the founding members of our board of directors. As you might remember in 2016, DeMatha went into a new form of, of governance where we had a, a Trinitarian board, we had the board of directors, we have a president, we have a principal. Uh, and David was one of the first men that we asked to be part of the uh, founding of the board of directors and his term has expired. So I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everybody who's on the Zoom uh, for acknowledging David. And I want to thank David uh, for his wisdom. As I described him uh, when we had our last meeting, David reminds me of someone who does a lot of listening and absorbing and then begins to speak with great wisdom. And that's a real gift to have when we're in any kind of a leadership role. So I have a plaque that just came in uh, and I will get it to David now. So the mail system is questionable. So I want to let David know it is here. I'll put it in the mail tomorrow. You'll probably get it by Christmas, but it is available to you. And here's what it says on the plaque. DeMatha Catholic High School Inc. is proud to honor and acknowledge David Aldridge for his dedicated service as a member of the Board of Directors and for his commitment to DeMatha's mission and the development of faith-filled gentlemen and scholars, 2016 to 2021. David, I am very grateful for everything that you've done for us publicly, professionally, but also for your uh, commitment and support of me uh, in this new role that I was taking. I always felt very confident that I could rely on you to Give me the best advice, and you certainly did that. So, God bless you, David, and Thank let's you, give Father. applause for David for his work. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. David. <laughs> Very well deserved. Thank you, Father. Um, I, I have so to I have to jump in and, and remind everyone that when I was on TV once, I I mentioned somebody, one of our alums. I, you know, alumnus of Matha High School. And I got an email the next day from Father saying, thank you for the for mentioning our, our alumnus. And please remember, it's DeMatha Catholic High School. You're right. You're right, Father. You're right. <laughs> well, thank you uh, Always so much. Pleasure. Always a pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much, David, for, for joining us today. Um, just, you know, kind of before we get started, just, you know, kind of want to see how you're doing. How's 
how's kind of life been treating you, you know, throughout this pandemic, how, you know, maybe mm-hmm. are, have things been different for you career wise? And, you know, if you could maybe speak about that for a second. Oh, yeah. Well, today, that ironically, is the first day, and I think it is roughly 400 days that both of our children are actually physically in school at the same time. Uh, first day. Um, they've been hybrid for the last seven months. Um, and this is the first day that they actually were both physically in school together at the same time. So that that's how I've been doing, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's just been like everyone else. It, it has completely turned our lives upside down. And um, and my my profession has been turned upside down. Um, the I was just speaking with someone yesterday at a Nationals game. Um, I was covering covering them. And we were talking in the press box about how we just took for granted for so many years, the idea that you could just go up to people and talk to them, you know, <laughs> like yeah. you could go up to players that you needed for a story and talk to them, or you could just go up to them and ask them how their day's going. And that has been my life for 30 years is get on a plane or get on a train or get in a car and go somewhere and go cover something. That's what I do for a living. Um, and the idea that you can't do that all of a sudden, that you have to stay in your house and try to cover an event 3,000 miles away when you you can't get anybody other than on one of these Zoom calls is just, it's a complete shock to the system. And it takes, and it I'm still not used to it. Um, because when you cover anything for a period of time for long enough, I mean, you kind of, it's part, it's a culture, right? I mean, the NBA is a culture. It's people that I've known for 30 years that you see at a game or in a hotel or at an airport or on a plane or somewhere. um, And you realize you've had a lifetime's worth of experiences with these folks and that's taken away. And it's hard. It's very hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for um, my family. It's hard for all of us on this call because we've all had to make these incredible changes to our lifestyle, but it is telling that you miss it. You miss just the human interaction more than anything else. I don't really miss flying, you know, like I don't really miss (laughs) that. What I do miss is seeing people in Houston or in Cleveland or in Golden State or in, you know, Utah or San Antonio, wherever you, wherever you happen to be that I miss terribly. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, especially with your with your profession. I mean, I was watching the Wizards game yesterday and they finally had, you know, some fans in the stadium. And just to see sure. the, the the joy on all these players faces that they finally get to have fans there. It's, I think we've gotten used to it and it's not a good thing, I guess, to get used to. But hopefully, you know, it'll, it'll be over soon and we'll, we're able to interact like like we used to. Um, David, just, you know, kind of a question. Um, you know, what, what inspired you to become a sports journalist? Like, you know, growing up, was there maybe someone that you looked up to or saw on TV and was like, man, I want to be just like him or, you know, maybe some influences that you had growing up? You know, the, the funny thing, Ben, is that my, my journalism, my liking and my growing love for journalism was really not about sports at all. I was the kid that read the Washington Post every day in 1973 and 1974 to see what Woodward and Bernstein had written next. Mm -hmm. I was that kid, (laughs) you know, like I really, that's how I fell in love with it. Cause I was like, wow, these two reporters are really like, everybody's talking about them all the time. Like they must be, they must be really talented or really powerful or maybe both, you know? Um, And so I thought that's when I first started thinking about could I be a reporter? Could I do that for a living? And I never thought about covering sports for a living ever. Even though I love sports, I just didn't think that was something that was possible. Um, it was a happy accident that occurred when I was at AU. Um, it just so happened that um, the one of my um, friends at AU who worked with me and I, I didn't cover sports I cut the university senate meetings and student government meetings and all the boring stuff that nobody else wants to cover and you know politician comes to town gives a speech I covered that that stuff mm-hmm. um but one of my friends had was working at the post part-time at the time um covering high school sports and the editor the high school sports editor, one of the two high school sports editors was an AU grad some of you 
your older participants in this may remember Mike Trilling and he covered high school sports forever, right? At the, at the post. And, you know, he was, he would give an AU kid a shot. Like he would say, come on in, we'll find something for you to do. That's when you could do that back in those days, you know? Um, and so my friend, Steve, who's still at the post, Steve Goff, who's covered soccer forever. That's what, that's my friend. <laughs> um, he's one of the best soccer writers on earth. So you should give Trills a call. He, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll be like, let you come in and cover stuff. And I, you know, it was like, I thought, well, I, it'd be nice to have a clip that says Washington post on it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be kind of cool. Um, and so I called him and he said, exactly what I said, come on down, we'll find something for you to do. And, and I covered high school sports for a year. Um, obviously I refused myself from covering the math. I couldn't do that. Um, but I covered football and basketball, uh, and, that's how I kind of got introduced to sports writing. And after I did that for a year, I was like, wow, I really like this. This is really, it's, it's immediate. It's, it's fun to cover sports because I was barely older than the high school kids I was covering. So I remembered what it was like to be at great games with great drama and rivalries and passion and things that, that, that are really important. And I felt that as a writer and I wanted to like, I was like, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of interesting that, you know, this is something that I seem to have the aptitude to be able to do. So I started thinking about sports and that just kind of continued on. And I was fortunate enough to get a job at the post after I graduated from college. Um, very, again, series of accidents, none of which had anything to do with my ability. It was just, they just happened to have a job come open at that time. For some reason, they offered it to me. I don't know <laughs> I still think I was the third person that they asked, but they, they deny that. Well, but I'll take it, you know. <laughs> hey, David, you've covered a lot of games, a lot of events throughout your career. What's, do you have a, a favorite athlete, favorite coach, or a favorite team that you've covered mm -hmm. throughout your career? You know, somebody asked me the other day who my favorite athlete of all time was, and I thought, of, I think it's Magic Johnson. I really do. I think he was just otherworldly with – the, there, there was just an energy to him, a magnetism to him, and I can't describe. And Jordan had it too. Jordan was the best player I've ever seen. But my favorite was probably Magic um, because he was just so elegant with the basketball. I can't describe how good he was orchestrating a team and getting everybody to the right spot and making the right decision every time. Um, so that he's probably my favorite athlete. Um, coach, gosh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. Probably Morgan, uh, actually. Um, so um, it's it's hard to say. There's there's been some that I thought were really kind of entertaining um, in their own way. Phil Jackson was a very entertaining, thoughtful, smart guy. Um, I always remember going into the coach's room at the old Chicago Stadium and seeing Phil doing the New York Times crossword puzzle that day <laughs> in ink. You know, like um, so that was always you know, he's a very smart guy. Um, and, and I like talking to him because he would always have something interesting or thoughtful to say, but there were a lot of great coaches. You know, Riley was a great coach. Chuck Daly was a great coach. You know, I mean, there were, there were a lot of, of coaches back then. Larry Brown as a, as a teacher of basketball is probably the best of all time. Like he's savantic if that's a word, I don't know if savantic's a word. He was a savant uh, when it came to teaching basketball to, to, to professional basketball players. It's just brilliant. Um, so I was able to, to get a lot. And, and, and I know people think they have this thought of me and Greg Popovich, right? <clears throat> and I've told people this all the time. If either of my two children, my, yeah, either of my two boys were ever talented enough to play basketball professionally, and they are not. But if either of them were... <laughs> I want Greg, I would want Greg Popovich to coach them um, because he is just an incredibly um, empathetic, smart, demand coach. I would think like any great teacher, the, the teachers you remember the most are the ones that demanded the most from you. 
because they thought you had the most to give. You know, they thought you had more to give and they wanted to get you to your absolute best, right? That's what all great teachers do, whether they're teaching English or orchestra or football, right? So, um, and he does that with his players. And I've had so many great conversations with him in his office that had nothing to do with basketball. Um, he's just a really interesting guy, really smart guy. That's fantastic, David. Now, speaking of, uh, of teachers, uh, I'd like to throw it over to, to Joe Carroll. Joe, if you want to unmute your mic here, I believe he's got a question. He may have a, a story or two about Pop you, David. quiz? So, yeah, to take out a sheet of paper, right? <laughs> uh, Mr. Car <laughs> Mr. Carroll, go ahead. Joe, your, your microphone's on mute. Okay. Um, there he is. David, flash from the past. Yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, speaking of pushback, all right, uh, I remember one um, story that you wrote in high school that you led off with uh, Wooten against Wooten. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I do. <laughs> I sure do. That was in your lead. Yes. I thought it was kind of clever. Did you get any pushback from that, um, uh, like being too much like the Washington Post? <laughs> no, you know, Mr. Carroll, no, I didn't really. Um, okay. Because I, 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 for those of, I mean, I'll, the, the backstory is that, you know, Morgan's daughter, Kathy, at the time, oh, God, I'm trying to, did she go, I don't know if she was at Seton or not. I can't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but she was a cheerleader for St. John's. She yeah. was a cheerleader for St. John's basketball team. We were playing St. John's. It was a big game. And, yeah. and I did a story on the fact that the coach of Gamatha's daughter was cheerleading for the other team. And I just yeah. wondered what that was like as a family, you know? So I was able to speak with both of them and they were both very forthcoming and, and, you know, gregarious about it. And I remember we won the game, of course. And I remember Morgan gave me this great line. He said, you know, I went over to Kathy after the game and I said, it's important that you not meet with success in everything that you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was a great lie. <laughs> have there been any other stories that you've gotten in your career that you've gotten some pushback from? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I had a, I had a, one of my journalism professors that I used to always say, if they're not mad at you every other week, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Oh, sure. All the time, <laughs> all the time. You know, like I write, I write, you know, uh, I have a combination. I write like straight news stories and then I write columns also. Um, and certainly the columns, half of it is you're an idiot. You know what you're talking about. Um, and, and, you know, people, you know, people always call and say, I got, you misquoted me or I didn't get quoted right. And I said, here's the tape. You want to listen to it together? <laughs> you know, like, um, so, you know, that never sticks because they know I, how I do my job. Um, but sure. People push back all the time. It's really not so much about you misquoted me. It's about tone, you know, shading, whatever they would, however they call it. And, I, I'd like to think after 30 years, I kind of know how to write a straight new story and play I, it down I would the think middle. So. <laughs> I, I you think even you've, got, what, you've got the hang of it. Yeah, I think I know what I'm doing. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. You know, like I said, the, the, the job is to, you know, when David Stern, the longtime commissioner, died a year ago, I wrote a tribute to him. And I, the first thing I, the lead to the story was you haven't lived till you've been cursed out by David Stern. And that's exactly right. <laughs> like, you know, like it's, it's a rite of passage. You expect it to happen, you know? So you write a story, okay. he calls, he curses you out. Okay. It's Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like, so <laughs> yeah, gotcha. that's, that's what happens. That's as I right. say life in the big city, you know? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Thank you, David. So we'd, uh, we'd like to open the, um, the floor to the audience now. So if you, you know, do have a question for, for David, please uh, indicate so in the chat bar at the bottom. Um, so first question, David, we have from, uh, from Joe Connolly. Joe, if you want to unmute your mic uh, and ask oh. David your question. <laughs> Sorry, it took me a second to find the unmute, unmute button. Uh, David, great to see you. Hope to see you again this fall at the 83 Open. I don't know if you're going to make yes, it. Yes, I, see Leroy, I see Leroy there. I don't know if he's going to make it, but... <laughs> I played with Leroy. Uh, 
Well, hey, uh, I had typed in a question that Ben kind of asked. It was a good question, so I'll skip that one. Uh, I want to throw something out a little bit off topic. I loved seeing Adrian Branch for the few years that he was in the studio. It just classic Adrian Branch, just kind of talking off the top of his head. Everything was fun. Everything was a joke. Yeah. Um, whatever happened to him as a broadcaster, is he still doing it somewhere? Ah, Joe, that is an excellent question, and I probably should know the answer to that. I know he was doing college games. He may still be doing college games. Uh, I have kind of lost track of Adrian the last three or four years, but my, my recollection is that after he left ESPN, and that's television, you, you're on a network for a while, and then you're on another network. That's just how it works. Um, he was doing, doing college games he was doing some studio stuff, but I think he was mainly doing college games, you know, out on the road doing a college game every Saturday or Sunday. Um, but I, that's the last I heard. But maybe one of our, uh, you know, alums that's on the call that Adrian was two years ahead of us, I think, if I remember, that maybe might know better um, what he's up to now. But I've kind of unfortunately lost track of him. But that's a good call. I need to try and get in touch with him, see how he is. Gotcha. Well, thanks for doing a Zoom. It's great to follow your career. It's it's great to see Matha represented so well. Thank you, Joe. Of course, you know my sports career started with a certain play <laughs> in 1983 <laughs> at the University of Maryland, and I had to. <laughs> you know, I didn't. I never saw the touchdown. Do you know that? <laughs> I'll, I was I'll send you the video in five minutes. Don't worry about it. I got. I was. It. <laughs> <laughs> I was on. I was on our sideline, but I was behind some Terry Jackson or somebody that was you know enormous, and I couldn't see. And I was like, and then all of a sudden everybody started screaming and jumping up and down. And I was like, what? Happened? <laughs> That's a, that was a good lesson for me. Always see the big play. <laughs> Please see the big play. It helps in my profession. So, Joe, thanks for your question and comment. David, our next question is from Gary Engelstad. So, Gary, go ahead and looks like your mic's unmuted. So, go ahead, ask your yeah, question. Yeah, David, a question about another Adrian that was uh, Adrian Dantley. Yes, sir. Um, we're very protective of our fellow DeMatha grads as they get into the pros. How bitter should he be about the whole experience with the Pistons and Isaiah Thomas? Um, fair question. Um, I'm sure Adrian still is not happy about how that ended, you know, because he had helped build that team. He was a major part of that team becoming a championship contending team. Um, and then at the very pinnacle, at the very point when they were ready to win, he was sent away. Um, and so I'm sure he is still not happy about that. But Adrian, I've seen him over the years. It's not the first thing. It's not front of mind. It's not what he spends his time brooding about or, or, or worrying about. You know, Adrian, as we, I think most people know, has become a really good referee um, and does a lot of games in the area, has done them for years. Um, and that's what, and he enjoys doing it. Um, so when I do see him, it's not like that's the first thing we talk about. You know what I mean? Like, so it's one of those things that happens in life. We all have those things where we feel like we were wronged. I'm sure he feels like he was wrong, um, but it's not, it doesn't consume you. It's not the thing that you think about every day when you wake up. And I don't think it's like that for, with Adrian. I can't speak for him, but I don't, I've never felt like that's front of mind with him in the times I've seen him since. And just a, a, a thank you for the podcast with Tori Clark on book reviews. That was uh, that was a lot of fun to listen to. Oh, so thank, thank you. you. I, it's one of the things I really do enjoy doing because I'm I'm a big believer. And no matter what it is that you do for a living, you need to think with a different part of your brain. Sometimes <laughs> like you can't just be so locked in. And that allows me to listen and to learn. And I really enjoy that. And I love listening to authors talk about the, cra the, the craft and the process of writing, because it's something that, that we all work with and struggle with from time to time. And it's great to hear people that are really good at it talk about it. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Gary, for your question. Uh, David, next, we'll go to our very own uh, Robert Landini, the <laughs> math is owned. Go ahead, Rob. Thanks, uh, Ben. David, thank you again for coming on this call. Um, I work here in our, at the math and our missions office, and we, I deal with our Stag for a Day program. So any eighth graders that come to school, I uh, plan all their visits. And one of the things we talk about is alumni that are, you know, out there in the field of, of work. And I mentioned that how, how many guys play NBA 2K, and, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them do, <laughs> and how you're the first guy they see on the video game before it starts. So I was just curious, what, what was that like, uh, you know, to get involved with and do?
Yeah, Rob, it was a it was a happy accident. It was not anything I was looking to do. I'm not a gamer. I don't play video games, and I'm not being critical of people who do. I just don't. I've never gotten into it. Um, yeah. And that was completely. And I said this all the time. Kevin Harlan, who's longtime uh, play by play guy at TNT, is totally the reason I got into the game because he did the game for many years beforehand, and he came to me in, in that Harlan voice, David, you've got to do this game. It's great. It's a lot of fun. You'll, you'll enjoy it. And, and it was fascinating learning the details that they go to to make sure the game is a, as authentic as possible, you know, to the point where they go to arenas, you know, pre-pandemic, they would go to arenas and simply just tape the crowd noise in every arena so that when they try to recreate, you know, Smoothie King Center in New Orleans, they have sound from Smoothie King Center in New Orleans. I mean, it's fascinating. The signage, all of that stuff, everything is, is, and they really do, they work incredibly hard at making it work. And I learned so much about that business, doing that game for the last, I don't know, five or six years, however long I've been doing it, um, to the, you know, the putting the motion capture suit on and going through that and and, the, you know, the kind of level of detail, I'll give you an example. They hired tall actors for me to interview as we put the game together. Not that we used, we rarely used their sound. They just wanted to see me holding a mic up to somebody that was taller than me. Naturally, like for real, like don't, like I wasn't pretending to interview somebody. I was actually interviewing a 6'9 guy who was an actor Um you know, talking about the game or whatever, going through the script that we were going through, just so that they can get the arm motion right, you know? And that just to me shows you the level of detail that, that they go to to make the, the game real for, for the consumers. And I just, I've learned so much and it's been, it's been a great education for me um, to know that this is not just something that they kind of whip together and, you know, they, they're like a year out before their next game comes out. I mean, they're already working on 22. I mean, they're probably close to done on 22 uh, by now. So, I mean, they, that's, they really do take a lot of time and, and really make a great deal of effort to make it, make it real. Uh, and it, uh, and I think it shows in the popularity of the product. Great. Awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, guys, sure. now, the guys who I mentioned to are like amazed by, we have a DeMatha grad doing the, you know, the <laughs> free game, the free game. So am I. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you're well known in the game. Trust me, the guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I know. I it, so. it's Rob, it's weird. It's a whole new world for me. Like 13 year old boys are coming up to me, going, "You, you're, you're great," and I'm like, "How do you know me?" Like, you know, like <laughs> it's weird. It's very weird, but it's very gratifying. It is very cool. Thank you. Hey, Rob, thanks for your question. Yeah, David, we we really enjoyed it last year. I think it was in last year's game where you had the uh, the one Dematha remark in the video. Oh game. yeah. <laughs> I always get it, get that in whenever I can. Sure. <laughs> we love it. We love it. All right, David, our next question is from Philip Berger. So go ahead, Philip. Hi, David. Uh, Phil Berger, class of 96. I've, uh, I've got three boys. They all play NBA live. So we'll yeah. switch that next year. We'll get NBA, <laughs> NBA 2K. Um, so I, I think it was probably like junior year. I was taking, I think it was U S government with Mr. Burke mm -hmm. and he, I don't know if it was the same for you, but my class, like every day we had to read the Washington Post and it either, you know, my parents got a subscription, so it was easy, but if not, yeah. we made sure there, there was all these copies in the library <clears throat> and like every day I have a pop quiz, two or three questions from like current events. So from that day forward, I've, I've religiously led, read the post. I've, I'm in business now, so I read the Wall Street Journal every day. I sure. love print journalism, but mm -hmm. where is it headed? Well, you know, things evolve, right? Um, Phil, I mean, I always, when people ask me that question, I, I always go, you know, at one point in our country's history, the most efficient way to get from one town to another was to get on a horse, you know, <laughs> like, and you'd get on a horse and you'd ride for weeks and, weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and you'd finally get to the other place if you survived, right? And then they decided, well, wait a minute, what if we put a, like a small, like, cart or buggy behind it could we we could take more people and they did that for a while and then somebody said let's let's put an engine in this thing and see if it goes you know like it evolves right and you just and so print will evolve it won't be you know there won't be three thousand daily newspapers ever again it's just not 
print uh, edition. But what there will be are, you know, 800 to 1,000 online subscription-based newspapers that you can get on your computer every day or on your on your phone or on your iPad. You know, that's that's where it'll go. Um, I, I I'm I'm fairly bullish about print, but it's just going to look different. It's just going to be on a screen. It's just going to be digital as opposed to physical newsprint because um, it just the advertising model just doesn't work anymore for for newsprint. It just doesn't. You know, it's not it, the newsprint's not cheap, but that's not the reason it's not working. It's working because they can't sell any ads. You just can't. People don't do that. There's no more box stores. You know, everything's online. So there's no point in advertising in a newspaper anymore. And that's why newspapers are dying, you know? So, um, but I still think people will advertise somewhere, right? And that's kind of the bet that whether it's YouTube or Netflix or any, or my, my you know, current place, The Athletic, we're making the bet that people will subscribe for unique and quality content. And I think they will. And I think they'll pay to read the New York Post or New York Post, the Washington Post and the New York Times. Um, the Wall Street Journal and, you know, uh, a few, not as many as I'd like, but still a few dailies that that do really good uh, newspaper work every day, do good print journalism every day. I think people still want more people than not want to know what's really going on in the world. Um, and, and so they'll I think they will they will continue to find ways to consume that information. Thanks, Philip. Um, David, before we get to another question, just got a question from, uh, I got a question for you. Just kind of want to go back to your, <clears throat> your DeMatha days. Uh, you know, do you have a favorite class, you know, favorite teacher? Maybe, you know, if you could share a DeMatha experience that kind of sticks out in your head and uh, if you have Oh, one. sure. Well, I've, you know, Mr. Carroll knows he's my favorite teacher of all time um, and always will be. And, and for a lot of reasons, but he not the least of which he's a brilliant English teacher. So, um, you know, just like, learning from people that know what they're talking about and that care about it. Um, but I had so many great teachers. I love Terry Quinn It taught in chemistry. He was a great teacher for a long time. Um, really wanted you to understand what was going on with the experiments you were running and, and made it fun. Uh, Joe Cantafio in history was, was a terrific history teacher. Um, enjoyed him a, a great deal. Uh, over the years. And I tell people all the time, the most gratifying class I ever took anywhere in any, you know, all the way through college was taking Rocco Manella in calculus. And I, and I say that because he gave me a C. <laughs> and it's the only C I've ever gotten in my life, ever, in any class. <laughs> and the reason why it's, it's, I'm gratified that I took the class was because I earned that C. I could, I do not understand calculus at all. <laughs> I had to grind and grind and grind and read and reread and met, you know, mess up and go back over the work. And I earned that C. <laughs> it's the absolute best I could do in that class. I did, I did everything I could to be good in that class and I got a C. And I remember that because I was like, you know what? This is what life is, you know, <laughs> like, Life is sometimes you have to do the job the best you can, even though you're not particularly good at it, right? <laughs> um, but you have to kind of figure it out and, and just kind of work with what you've got. And I, I remember that C to this day um, because I earned it. Like I really earned that C. Um, so uh, that was a, a very gratifying uh, class that I took, you know, um, you know, I see Mick Charlie Kenny of the World of Work. That was a great class. I enjoyed um, the great Joe Mahalik taught me algebra. That was a great class. <laughs> the one class I wish I had taken props that with Mr. Samordic. That's the one class everybody because they went to the racetrack, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Everybody's like, we're going to Pimlico next week. And I was like, ah, I should have taken that class. So. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, David. Um, oh, Charlie Kenny actually just said, uh, he said he was an A student in my class. <laughs> Very good. That was a fun class. But you know what? You know what's funny, Ben? Like I the classwork was obviously, you know, it helped us all learn and get better and, and be more empathetic, I think, towards other people. But it was really just the relationships with classmates and, mm -hmm. and the things we did together and being at football games in the fall and being at basketball games in the winter and and you know the the dances and prom and things like that. Um the times you spend 
being class guys is what I'm always going to remember more. You know, being in the lunchroom, in the cafeteria, and I know Father James will hate this, but occasionally the lights would go out and we'd start throwing food. I don't know how that happened. I'm not sure yeah. who did it. <laughs> I just know that it happened, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, of course. You know, and then, put, you know, doing the, the paper, you know, with Joe Colella, who was a good friend of mine in high school. I just, I just had a, it was fun. It was so much fun. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was the experiences of becoming a young man and, and trying to understand not just the academic part, but the spiritual and religious part of, of, of life um, at that point in my life was very important to me and gave me an incredible grounding, I think. Yeah. Um, I just think being at, at DeMatha was just, it was just, it was just a great experience. And I learned so much about myself, but I learned about other people and trying to meet other people where they are in the world and, and not having all the answers and knowing that you don't have all the answers and trying to listen to other people and maybe they have an answer for you. Um, it was, it was incredibly gratifying. Yeah, I, I uh, totally agree with you, David. I think a lot of alums on this, on this call can, can share those same sentiments as well. Um, so we'll go uh, last three questions here. I'll uh, toss it over to Todd Sanzone. Todd, if you'd like to ask your question to David. Thanks, Ben. Hey, everybody. Hey, David. Great talking hey, with you. Yes, sir. I, um, I, I want to say first, I enjoy not only your career and your reporting and your own um, writing, but I've also enjoyed you, as somebody else alluded to earlier, uh, you and uh, Tori and the gang uh, on the book podcast, as well as, you know, La Chizerie to you, sir. Uh, the <laughs> T TK you. group, it seems like we probably got a lot couple TK fans here as well. So, sure. uh, so yeah, I've been following you in that vein as well for a while and, and just uh, uh, real happy to have you here today. My, my question is kind of simple, but I also want to kind of piggyback on the last question as well. My first question was just going to be, you know, I wonder what is the most satisfying thing to you uh, about journalism, which something I've never re really gotten into, but it's always been like a nagging thing in the back. Like, mm -hmm. I kind of wish I had done that. So I wonder what, you know, satisfaction you derive from just the whole package that, that comes along with being a journalist and then also you know based on the, the the future of print or lack thereof I don't know how do you feel about that you know what's your opinion about what, where things are going to go and, yeah. and what challenges that's you're going to face with uh the migration the completion of the migration because we're already migrated right to uh to digital versus print well uh first question um you know, I think all journalists are storytellers. We like telling stories, you know, um, and I love telling stories. I love to introduce a, a reader to something that they may not know about or that they may have been curious about and wanted to read more about or learn more about um, because I'm like that. I am always, you know, I think we all can kind of go down the rabbit hole of Twitter. You see this story and somebody said, hey, this is an interesting story. And you read that, and you know, that leads you to three other things that you want to read. And then hours gone by, right? So um, I just love telling stories. I love to kind of let people know, hey, here's this thing, or here's this person, and this thing is happening to them, or they're doing this thing that's kind of interesting. Um, and you know, sometimes it's a it's a uplifting story, and sometimes it's a sad, tragic story. But that's life, right? Life is up and down, and up and down, and that's what we do as human beings. Um, so. I, I just love that. I love being able to kind of let people know I'm working on this thing that's going to come out in the athletic, hopefully in the next day or two that I'm really excited about. It's about one thing. It's about this one thing that nobody would otherwise pay any attention to. And I just think it's really fascinating to me. Like um, there's a craft to it, um, to what this, this person does doing this one thing. Um, and the future, you know, I think again, I, to me, the challenge will be, making digital accessible to everyone. That to me is the greatest challenge because there are so many communities that aren't able to access the type of journalism, you know, whether it's with us at The Athletic, you know, we're relatively inexpensive, but, um, you know, all the way up again to Netflix and some of the, you know, HBO Max and some of the other places where you have to pay for content. Well, everybody can't do that, right? And so how, the challenge is how do you get that product that you want everyone to see to everyone, you know, on a, in a pay model. And that's the challenge to me. Like you have to be able to let 
every consume your product. I mean, I think that's what we all strive for. I don't care who reads my story. I want everybody to read my story, stories. Um, but everybody can't afford to pay for the subscription. So what do you do? How do you do that? And that's that's going to be the challenge, I think, for journalism. Because, you know, in our day, the post was 25 cents. You know, most people have 25 cents. They can get a paper if they want to know what's going on in the world. Well, it doesn't work like that anymore. <laughs> you know, like, so how do you, how do we bring that those stories to people in rural areas, people in underserved communities? How do we do that? And that's the challenge to me. That's the big challenge for journalism going in, you know, as we continue through this, through this century is, you know, how do we democratize small D uh, journalism for people. Thanks, Todd, for your question. Today we got a question from Vaughn Jones. Go ahead, yes. Vaughn. Hey, everyone. Hey, David. How are you? Hey, Vaughn. Good. Good, hey, sir. Good. I, I have uh, my, my nephew is going to be an incoming freshman at DeMatha um, coming up next year. And he loves, like, he wants to be a broadcaster. Do you have any advice or any like internships? That's something that maybe he can tap into, mm -hmm. um, or, or you know something that we can try to get him involved with. You say he's starting it. He's starting next year at Dematha. Yeah, he's an eighth grader. He'll be a ninth grader okay. in fall. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is perfect because he's got plenty of time. Um, you know what? <laughs> I swear to God, I remember doing this like it was yesterday, going to. Um, you know, Kenner League, Jellif League in the summertime, begging Eddie Sai over at Sidwell Friends to let me just sit at the top of the stands with a tape recorder <laughs> and broadcast yeah. the games. Yeah. <laughs> and just Eddie do my play-by-play -play -play of the game. Just wow. begging him, Eddie, please let me go sit up there. I won't bother anybody. I won't, I won't talk too loud. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I would do that. I would just start doing, you know, what, whatever it is he wants to do, if he wants to do play by play or if he wants to do sidelines or things like that. Um, this is where, you know, if you get started early enough, um, you know, I should know this and I don't know, you know, what, what the math situation is with regard to uh, television. I don't know that we have a TV station. Maybe we do. I'm sorry if I didn't know that. Um, I, think, I think we do. I think if we, we do, do, he should do that. You know, I mean, I really do. I mean, that's how you learn. That's how you start learning. You have to start somewhere. I, there are tapes of me screaming play by play, just awful, God awful play by play when I was in high school and college, just terrible. You know, just the decibel levels are ridiculous and I'm talking way too loud. Nobody can understand me, but that's how I got better. You know, because I had to start by learning not to do that, right? I had to have a producer come to me and say, you have to stop yelling. <laughs> you know, like nobody can understand you. <laughs> um, so, but I had to do that. And this is when you learn to do those things. This is when you start the process of becoming a broadcaster or, or a reporter is in high school and college. It's the perfect training ground because you can make all of your mistakes and almost nobody knows that you're making them, right? And so you get better and better and you get more reps and you get more comfortable and you learn how to do it a little better. So I would definitely look into, you know, the broadcast opportunities, whether it's, you know, it could be sports. It probably should, you know, it would be sports obviously um, that are available. Um, there are people that do high school games. I know that um, that have that cover high school games in the area. I know we do some of that sometimes, but I know other people do as well. And those are areas where I would say, hey, look, is there, even if you don't get on air right away, just shadow people for a couple of days. Just say, I just want to listen to how you guys do a game, you know, and they can see the notes that the play-by-play -play guy takes or that the color guy takes, or if they interview the, the coaches before the games, how they get information that way, you know, so, it's this is the perfect time to get started on that. So I would definitely look into that and failing all else, you know, write, write for the paper, you know, cover the teams for, for the paper. You know, I mean, that's a, that is it. That's how I started my first interview. I interviewed Jerry Franks in his office. <laughs> that was my first, the first time I ever interviewed anybody for anything was sitting in Jerry Franks office talking about the upcoming football season for DeMatha. Um, and it was a terrible interview. <laughs> it was just, I'm sure it was <laughs> awful. But, you know, he was gracious enough and Morgan was gracious enough to say, come on, I'll talk to you, <laughs> you know. 
these games, and um, and they did. That's how I started learning. Yeah, Dave, uh, David, actually, real quick, and Vaughn, I was going to just say, um, I don't know if Neil Murphy's still on, this, on the call, but I know that um, they allow the students to uh, do the play-by-play -play for, like, the freshman and JV basketball games. Uh, Vaughn, so that would be a great oh. opportunity for – I know Neil Murphy does the uh, the varsity guys, but uh, I'm pretty sure, Neil, if I'm not mistaken, but I think they're allowed to do the JV freshman. They um, they let the students call the oh, game. Oh, dude, that's, so. okay. that's perfect. Oh. Yeah, Vaughn, well, that's cool. perfect. Yeah, yeah well, that's perfect. Yeah, and I'm gonna I, I I'll I'll reach out to Coach Murphy then. I he can he can pair up with Coach Murphy and, and learn from the best. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, David. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for the question. Uh, last question here for you, David. We'll go to uh, to Jason Blue. Hey, David. Thank you for doing this today. Um, sure. Real quick, my uh, my father owned the Post Pub around the corner from. Ah, oh, so sure. Ho ho hopefully, you had a burger or a beer one time. But uh, spent many a night there. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, my question is related to what seems like, especially NBA, kind of um, more social awareness and and talk about political type things mm -hmm. with, with, by athletes um, and by extension, people who cover the games. Mm -hmm. LeBron James kind of sticks out most recently as, as someone who who has taken uh, that role on. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious about your thoughts on that development. And as a side question, what do you see LeBron himself doing when he uh, when he hangs up the sneakers? Thank you. I will I will answer the second question first, if that's OK. I think LeBron is going to become some sort of entertainment mogul. Right. He's going to do movies and TV shows and and and, you know, original programming. I, I really think that's his wheelhouse. I think that's what he's really passionate about. Um, so my guess is he will be in the business of storytelling, you know, much like Kobe was, unfortunately, you know, sadly, he, he couldn't. He didn't live to continue that work, but I think LeBron is going to be in that space. I just have a feeling that's what he wants to do. Um, I don't think he's much interested in politics, like running for office or anything like that. I get no sense from him that he wants to do that. Um, he'll be connected to basketball through his sons, I'm sure, right? At some, whatever level they play at. Um, I could never say he wouldn't never like buy a team. I suppose that's possible too. Um, he is in that strata where he could very easily put a group together to, you know, raise two or $3 billion to buy it, to uh, buy a sports team. And he already bought, he bought into Man U at one point, he just bought a piece of the Red Sox, you know, I mean, he's got his tentacles in a lot of different places. Um, as far as the, so the social aspect, uh, you know, that, that, that athletes are engaging in, I think it's, it's part and parcel with athletes kind of taking more control of their messaging um, which is a reality. I, I wish that they were still gatekeepers. I wish that they would still come to us to tell whatever stories they want to tell, but they don't have to do that anymore. Um, they have their own Twitter followings. You know, LeBron's got, I don't know, 30 million people on Twitter that follow him. Um, they have their own production companies. They write for the Players Tribune. They write their first person things for that, you know, for, for the Tribune. Um, own YouTube channels, their own Instagram following with millions of people. Um, so they can really control how they communicate with their fans. Um, and so I think that this is part of that. And it's understandable that in the last two years, certainly, I think everyone has become more aware of what's going on in the world or more willing to talk about what they think is going on in the world. And LeBron's never been shy about expressing his opinions on, on social issues going all the way back to Trayvon Martin. So it doesn't surprise me that, that he's, that he continues to do that. And, and I think to your point, LeBron is a, is a real influencer role model for a lot of other athletes that, that feel like, Hey, I, I, you know, I want to speak up too. I, I want to talk too about these things. And so I think they kind of work hand in hand. I think it would have happened more anyway, just because athletes are taking more control over their messaging. Um, but certainly, you know, the last, again, the last two years, especially, I think have been so wrenching in so many different ways that, that people just feel an obligation to speak out. They don't want to be silent in this time. They want to express their opinions about what's going on and, and their, their feeling about justice and, and social justice and racial justice and gender justice and all those things. And it's, it's, again, I, it, 
it's understandable because it's part of that messaging um, grab that they that, that a lot of athletes and entertainers as well are, are doing to kind of control their own their own uh, brand and product. Thank you, thank you, Jason, for your question. Uh, so that's awesome. I think that'll that'll conclude our, our afternoon with David. Uh, before I throw it over to David for some closing remarks, I just want to thank. Uh, obviously, David, and for everyone for your uh, for joining and, and, and asking terrific questions uh, and for David for taking the time out of his, his busy day to to talk to us. It's always a pleasure. David, thank you for you know everything you've done you know, for Damatha being on the board and your, your time and commitment and support. Uh, always. We're very we're very proud to, to call you our own, David. So so thanks again. Sure. Um, and for everyone else, we'll obviously be back uh, same time uh, next week, 12 o'clock on, on Thursday. Uh, so with that, I'll like to throw it over to David for, for closing remarks. Well, Ben, thank, thank you, man. Um, you know, I think, I, I hope people understand um, what the math means to me and, and, and how I feel like I, my life was changed. The funny thing is my, my three best friends all went to Carroll. <laughs> they all went to Carroll. And to this day, when somebody, people ask me this all the time, like, why did you go to the math? And I really... I can't really remember. I just wanted to go to Damatha. I don't know. I, like I'm not an athlete. I didn't play. Um, but I I just wanted to go to Damatha. I just thought every time I picked up the paper, Damatha was doing something great. And I thought I want to be in, I want to be involved with that. You know, like I want to be a part of that. That seems like that's a special place. And it is. <laughs> and, it, and it is. Um, so thank you for having me. You guys know you I've been on the board for five years and um, you know we're we want to make sure that everybody can have the same experience that we did at the math right so that's why i'm always like you know contribute to the fund for Damatha. you know i think everybody got the mailing in october and it's 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 for people of all walks of life who want to go to Damatha. and i think that's such a i, I always say this and people get sick of me saying this at these meetings that we have that we have such a great story to tell about the school. We have a great story to tell, you know, like I think people, the perception that they have of the math is so not real. The real story is really good. It's really entertaining and it's really meaningful. You know, I think most people who are on this call are sons of people who work for a living. I know I was, I know I am. Right. And so, I want other kids whose parents have to work for a living to be able to go to Damatha. So if we can help them in any way, you know, I really hope we can do that. I try to do that. I know everybody here does it probably, but it always hurts, doesn't hurt to ask again. So thank you for having, having me on and, and, you know, one Damatha as always. Love you guys. One Damatha. Thank you so much, David. Go Stags. Take care.